Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining my wife and I today in our living room as we record the sermon that I'm going to be giving today. The title of today's message is Jesus Runs After Us. The parable of the prodigal sons shows us how our father responds to his prodigal son and to his faithful quote-unquote eldest son. He loves us all unconditionally. So as we go deeper into this subject and see how that happens each and every day for each and every one of us, let us begin with prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to us. That was the major step in you pursuing us and Jesus was willing to pursue us, showing us your love, giving his life on the cross, paying for our sins, being raised from the dead and sharing his spirit life with us through the Holy Spirit. Dear God, you are so awesome and so wonderful. You love us no matter what. Help us to see your love. It says in your word that we love you because you first loved us. You're the one who pursues us, and finally we realize it. Help us to realize it today and to respond so that we can also pursue you. We do thank you and ask you pray your blessing and inspiration on this message today to be with the hearer of it and the speaking of it from your holy word. We ask and pray this now in Jesus' holy name, and all together we say, Amen. Amen. Let us begin with Luke, the 15th chapter. I'm reading from the NIV version, NIV version of the Bible. <coughs> Pardon me. And so we want to, <coughs> excuse me, Luke 15, a bit, beginning in verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. <coughs> in other words, they didn't. And so when Jesus did, they thought there was something wrong with that. But that's God pursuing us right there. Verse 3, Then Jesus told them this parable. <coughs> Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety and nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And they could agree with that. <clears throat> and when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Joy Rejoice with me, I have found <clears throat> my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. So it sets up the story of the prodigal son and the elder brother who need the father's pursuit just as much as the other. Let's notice that beginning in verse 11. <clears throat> Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Didn't need to do it because he was not dead yet, but he did it anyway because he loved his sons. <clears throat> Verse 13, Not long after that, the younger son got together. All he had set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. And after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So you see how God helps us through a severe famine. How it helps us to come to our senses. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs ate or were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, and that's always the case, when God pursues us, we do eventually come to our senses. He said, How many of my father's hired servants have found food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will sit out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. So repentance grew in his heart. And he went to make amends. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, 
threw his arms around him and kissed him. It's like he had never gone anywhere or done anything that he shouldn't have because he was his son who had returned home. But notice what it said there. His father saw him from a distance and was filled with compassion and he ran to his son to receive him even sooner. The son said to him in verse 21, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. No, he's willing to be just a servant. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Totally unexpected to the younger son. How could this possibly be? Do you realize what a scoundrel I am? And his father did. Just like our father does. He runs to us anyway. He runs to us in Jesus. Right now. He runs to us through the Holy Spirit. God runs to us. He loves us. He wants to celebrate with us. In verse 25, Then, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of his servants and asked him, What's going on? Well, your brother's come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has come back safe and sound. You'd think that'd be good news to the older brother, wouldn't you? <laughs> no. The older brother became angry. Ah, this isn't fair, he said, and refused to go in. So his father went out. See, the father went to him and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders until now. But now he is disobeying his orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when his son, this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, and of course he's assuming a lot of things there, comes home, you kill the fat calf for him. And the father replies, My son, the father said, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Son, you could always have whatever you desired. You've always been there with me. Now celebrate. Your younger son or brother has come home. So Jesus showed us his father's love in this parable, which is what Jesus did when he was on the earth. He expressed the same love his father showed to him. And so Jesus today loves us as the Father loves him. The Father's love is what pursues us. Jesus. Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit to us. The Holy Spirit. God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit pursue us. But the one who amplified it and expressed it fully was Jesus. In his years on the earth, 30, uh, three and a half years, or 33 years. So, so here we are with this undeniable truth. And he's going to show us again that in real time as we'll, as we'll come to see. So Jesus did show us his Father's love in real time when he went to the lake to show his disciples how much he loved them and that their mission was still before them. He got them back on track. And I believe that's what needs to happen with a lot of people today. A lot of people who are Christians, they need to be getting back on track. We have a mission yet to fulfill. Jesus hasn't returned in glory yet. We need to do what our Father wants us to do, what Jesus wants us to do, what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. We need to get back on track. Let's notice over in Luke, the 18th chapter, and verse 6. Luke 18 and verse 6.
And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for His chosen ones who cry out to Him day and night, as perhaps many of us are doing? Will He not do that? Do you still believe that? Will He keep putting them off? Is that what you think is happening here? Well, I tell you, He will see that they get justice. That's a promise from Jesus. And quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? Getting back on mission or on point takes faith. Faith in Jesus. Jesus gives us His faith in the Spirit. It takes faith to stay with it no matter what the surrounding evidence looks like. So we see here over in John 21 then, that was something that his uh, disciples had lost sight of after his resurrection from the dead. Everything was different, and so they didn't relate to it. And Jesus for now was the risen Lord, but it wasn't the same. And they were having a hard time transferring what it was before to this new reality. And John 21 shows us that. And then Jesus' response to it. John 21, the Gospel of John. Afterward, Jesus appeared, this is verse 1, again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together because they had been fishermen before, and now they're trying to be fishermen again. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and, he, and they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Sounds like the first time Simon Peter was trying to catch fish, and Jesus came to him then. Verse 4, early in the morning Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. So you know when we're not understanding our mission, it's harder to see Jesus because we're leaving Him out of it. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And He said, Well, throw your net on the right side of the boat. Remember, He did that very same thing to Peter before when He called him to follow Him. And you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish, just like the first time. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! <laughs> Something vaguely familiar about that. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, because he was apparently having less than he needed for public uh, expression with others. For he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it. So Jesus had already caught fish and brought them in and put them on to cook. And some bread. Now Jesus knew how to be a good host, how to put on a good meal that you can uh, break bread together. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught, so we'll cook up some more fish. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. And some say this represented all the, represents all the countries in the world today. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Yes, come and eat with me. Let us break bread. Let us talk together. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? See, we knew Jesus who was teacher, who was God in the flesh, but we don't think we know you. But they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he raised, was raised from the dead. Remember, the other two times were in the upper room. 
So, in verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? In other words, his fishing buddies, people he used to be in partnership with before, fishing for fish. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, well, then take care of my sheep. What are you out here fishing like this for? you got plenty of sheep you're going to need to take care of. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter now was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, well, then feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go, referring to crucifixion, death. See, the thing that the disciples didn't get was that others were going to be called to become followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, if you will, and they were going to need to teach them about Jesus and all the things they did together for three and a half years of ministry. It was going to be very important. They'd even write books of the Bible about it all. Because it's so important for us to understand. Verse 19, Jesus said, This is to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. Jesus pursues us so we can follow him from that point on. In the Spirit. Now Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them, and this was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper, in other words, John, the disciple John, at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? And when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Why is he getting off? You know, John was the one who wrote Revelation, so he didn't die at the hands of others, but died of natural old age on the island of Petrus. And Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me, Peter. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die, referring to John. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? And what is it to any of us? We're all individuals. Jesus knows us all very well. And he wants us all to be with him for eternity as a child of our Father. This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that this, his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. I'm sure that everything Jesus did was that way. All should have been written down. But now we learn those things in the Spirit as we read the words that we have now to give us the Gospel. <clears throat> so his, you know, Jesus is asking His disciples about when he returns in glory. Will he find faith on the earth? And so he's asking them the same question in person. He wants them to understand and have faith and do the mission, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the whole world. First in Jerusalem, then in Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is pursuing us with his Father's love so that we can receive our Father's will as his holy children. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, the 5th uh, chapter. I have skipped over unintentionally a, a scripture back here I would like to read to us. Because we're talking about Jesus sharing our Father's love. And I did not read this scripture in John, the 15th chapter. And I need to do that. John 15 and verse 9. 
As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. See, that's the way it is. Jesus showed us the Father's love. That's how the Father loved Jesus. And now, Jesus is sharing that love with us. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Only wants the best for us at all times. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And that's what it, his original disciples were asked to do for us today. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Hallelujah. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. And he has done the same for us today. Fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you if our Father receives the glory in what we ask. This is my command, love each other. That's his command to us today, love each other. No exceptions. He loves all of us, we need to love each other, one and all. Nobody's left out. So let's go to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. And beginning in verse 14, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. This is the Father's will for us today. The Apostle Paul encapsulates the Father's will here for us in these verses. These are so meaningful. We need to really pay attention to what they tell us. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, For Christ's love compels us. See that same love in John 15. The love of the Father, that's Christ's love, compels us. See, He's coming, He's pursuing us, compels us, coming after us to set us right, right on the track that we can produce much fruit as the Spirit leads us. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Yes, we all have our old person, man or woman, die and the new creation come. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So what is Jesus doing today as the risen Lord that we need to be participating with him about? That's the question. The answer is coming. Verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view because we are a new creation. We have a new mind and we have a new heart and we see things differently and we feel things differently and we go to the Word for confirmation of that and we see it's true. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, humanly, we do so no longer. God in the flesh. God sent to us His Son, Jesus, to be fully God and fully man. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. It's here in us. It's in us. The Holy Spirit lives in us, in our hearts. Jesus lives in our hearts. The old is gone, the new is here. So let's throw the old out and keep it out. Bar the door. Don't let it back in. Say, no, you can't come back in here. I belong to Jesus. Because in verse 18, all this is from God, our Father. It's all His idea. He sent His Son. His Son said, yes, Father, I will do this. I want to share your love with the whole world who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, the Father did, gave us the ministry of reconciliation that his Son is doing on this side of the cross. And we need now more than ever in history, we are so non-reconciled in our world. We are so sad and miserable because of that. There's no one who can replicate the reconciliation in Jesus. Nobody who can forgive sin through their death because no one's perfect to die for us except Him. 
And this is what that reconciliation looks like. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And we don't have any of that going on today. No one's sorry for anything. And people lie and cheat and steal and kill and murder. That's what we do today and say, we deserve it. And no reconciliation happens. There's no desire for reconciliation. We just want to get our own way. And he has then therefore committed to us, the readers of this word, the message of reconciliation. The message. You know what it is? Huh. It's, it's in the Bible here, throughout Genesis to Revelation. It's all through there. I've done so many different sermon messages on so many parts of the Bible. There are a time to reconcile.com forward slash. It will actually go to youtube.com forward slash a time to reconcile. That's where you can find them. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So if we are ministers of his reconciliation, then we are ambassadors of his, for his kingdom. His kingdom is the kingdom of light in heaven. We represent that kingdom on earth. When Jesus comes back in glory, he's going to bring that kingdom with him. And we're going to represent it coming. And when it gets here, we'll be representing it in real time. Here on the earth, new heavens and new earth, new Jerusalem, for eternity with Jesus. And what is the message that we're implored to give today? Be reconciled to God. I don't hear anybody saying that. But it sure seems like we ought to. It sure seems like that ought to be the mission field for us because that's what God wants. That's why He sent His Son Jesus to us. He wants us to be His holy children forever. We've got to start talking about it, praying about it, studying about it. The whole Bible's filled with it. We need to get back on track, brothers and sisters in Christ. And those of you who are not, we need you to come and believe the message of Jesus for today, for you and your family, and for the whole world. In verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So not only are we the children of God, but we're the holy children of God, because Jesus attributes his righteousness to us. We don't have any righteousness. But he has righteousness and he attributes it to us. Oh, hallelujah. We have such a wonderful God who pursues us through Jesus and now through the Holy Spirit, through the Word, to reach out to us and say, look at what it says. Why haven't we done these things? Well, maybe the time hasn't been right until now. But let me tell you one thing. The time is right now because this world is in a mess. And we are the only ones who can understand what the reconciliation is and how it needs to be applied. I take a little study, a little prayer time, a little leading of the Spirit to us, but it's there. So brothers and sisters and everybody listening, we need you to be ministers of Christ's reconciliation and ambassadors of His kingdom of light. Please join with me in prayer. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for pursuing us, by sending Jesus to us. Thank you, Jesus, for pursuing us and showing us the Father's love. Thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for giving us the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. So we, are, we were pursued to that end, that we would be Spirit-led from that point on going forward. We need you. We need your mission field. We need your ministry of reconciliation in our hearts. We need your ministry of ambassadorship of the kingdom of heaven coming from heaven to earth in glory. We look forward to that time, but we have a work to do. The Father's telling us, you've got a work to do. Come join my son's ministry of reconciliation. So help us to do that, dear God. We love you because you first loved us, but we love you. And we desire to be with you for eternity 
We thank you and ask and pray for your blessing, protection, inspiration this coming week. And it's in your most holy and righteous name, Jesus, that we pray. And all together we say, Amen.